Okay, last time we spent a bit of time trying to talk about um, basic expansions. Let's expand in the smallness of electric field perturbations, and we went through second order and then third order, meaning three wave couplings, and then fourth order, four wave couplings, and stuff like that. But what I want to do today is to talk about some other ways of doing things, and we're still, remember, on let's call it nonlinear effects here. Um, and so the basic idea. Uh, is that last time we talked about the perturbative schemes. Um, and, uh, well, and let me just then make a sort of a general comment on the usefulness of that. Um, when could we use it? Uh, so let's say usefulness of perturbative schemes like that. And, you know, you go until you're tired of calculating terms or until you get the physical effects you think you need. Uh, and the basic idea is that they're quite good for cases where you're perhaps injecting a wave and you're trying to perhaps heat a plasma, you know, like inject a wave at the ion cyclotron frequency and you say, well, I'd like to figure out how to heat the plasma with this ion cyclotron wave. And usually that's a fairly small amplitude and has a weak interaction with the plasma. So the basic guy, and for that case, it turns out only you only need second order quasi-linear type stuff for the most part. And uh, so if the ampl it's so the basic idea is if you inject the wave and it's fairly low amplitude, uh, then it's okay. So it's sort of good for low amplitude. A little hard to define some, sometimes exactly what low amplitude means, but we'll come back to that a bit. Um, low amplitude injected uh, waves. Um, for example, ICRF, RCRH, uh, ion cyclotron heating of plasmas, or other RF heating of plasmas. So that's sort of the, the general comment. But it's not very useful, um, that sort of perturbative approach, although some people have tried to use it for, um, um, what do you call it, for a sort of weak turbulence theory. Um, but it's not really so good there. So it's sort of not so useful if one of two conditions is met. One is that the wave is, is so large um, the wave is large amplitude, high amplitude. Um, so large is again, you know, you have to define. But anyway, large amplitude and uh, leads to coherent effects. And I'll talk about those uh, in a little bit. And those coherent effects are typically non-expandable. Uh, you, if you expanded them in a power series, you would require the entire power series. Um, hence, we would call them non-expandable um, essential singularities in the language of um, uh, complex variables. Um, and in that case, it turns out we have to treat things with a sort of nonlinear coherent wave treatments. And so those will be things like uh, we'll get into the Cordovec de Vries equation, nonlinear Schrodinger equation, those sorts of things. We'll mention a bit here in a moment. Um, the, so the, the one reason why the low amplitude or the perturbative procedures won't work is because of high amplitude. The other is if you have many, many waves interacting with a particle um, or another wave. Uh, in that regard, what you imagine is suppose I'm sitting in a plasma and I... Um, I'm a particle here, and if I'm sort of moving along and all of a sudden I get kicked by one wave, and then I move a little further and I get kicked by another one, completely different wave. Kicked means, you know, suffer a force, an impulse, basically, from the interaction with each wave. And maybe I, you know, keep getting jiggled by all kinds of different waves as they pass past me or something. Then, you know... Uh, what happens then is you get into a more a situation which you should treat more like a statistical description. Uh, statistically, I'm the particle sitting here and I get kicked by all, all of these waves. So if I, that's if I have many waves of one particular amplitude. Uh, 
So it's, this perturbative procedure is also not useful if you have many waves uh, of about the same amplitude. Uh, present, and this usually le leads then to plasma turbulence um, and it also leads to statistical, let's call them statistical descriptions. Now, what I want to do now is, is then tell you a little bit about these two subjects, and uh, that is to say, when we would go from a low amplitude to a high amplitude, and then type of situation, and then something about what happens when you have many waves present. The way I want to tell you about that is not to do it in a plasma example for a moment, but to do it to, to consider what types of low amplitude, large amplitude effects we can have in simply the interaction of a particle with a simple sinusoidal potential. So it's just a particle in a, in, a, in a wave, let's say. And we'll, by doing this, consider things like uh, trapping of waves in a, uh, in a potential. So it still looks like I need to go down just a little bit size here. OK. So, this, so what we want to do is then treat sort of figure out what we mean by these non-expandable effects and get some, some feeling for it. And the subject we're going to be treating is basically to consider uh, particle motion in the presence of a wave. And we'll sort of say this for arbitrary amplitude. but it's going to be a single wave. Okay, so what we um, think of then, for instance, is that we have some perturbation potential. We'll just do electrostatics here. And I will choose it in a very special way. Namely, it's minus phi hat. The phi hat will be an amplitude. And I'll imagine a certain phase. I usually write e to the i k dot x minus i omega t. Uh, but here I'll take it just as cosine k x minus omega t. And then my uh, good old Newton's law, f equals m a, for this particular situation, gives me that the mass times the acceleration, d squared x by dt squared, is equal to uh, q times the electric field. The electric field's minus grad phi, and that phi, so this is minus q grad phi tilde. Tilde, just to keep reminding me a little bit that this is a small amplitude wave, maybe small amplitude, maybe large amplitude. We'll see. Um, and then uh, I take the gradient of this. The gradient of the cosine will flip the sine, so when I take the gradient, I'll still get the minus. So we'll get minus. Um, Q, K um, in the X hat direction now sine of KX minus omega T. So um, just uh, I could have made this a vector, but the only part I'm caring about since I don't have, I'm not considering any magnetic field or any complications like that, um, is just one dimensional. So this equation just becomes then D squared X by DT squared is equal to minus uh, Q phi hat over M uh, K sine of KX minus omega T. Now, this is a little bit of an awkward equation to deal with because uh, it has a, you know, the, the forcing, the force here is time dependent. How can I get rid of that? Well, if I transform to a frame of reference moving with the phase velocity of the wave, I'll actually take that away. So what we do is we say, well, I'll define some new x hat, which is relative to the wave, as x minus the phase velocity times time. And that is just x minus omega over k times time. <coughs> 
And if I do that, then you can see that in parentheses here, I effectively just have my k dot x minus omega t, except that, well, it's kx hat then. And the second derivative here with respect to time will vanish, of course, because that doesn't uh, count. So what we get for our sort of final equation is d squared x hat dt squared, where x hat is going to be the, dv, the particle motion relative to moving at the phase velocity of the wave, is equal to minus q phi hat over m times k sine kx hat. And that becomes the equation which we're uh, interested in solving now. So the question is, how do we approach um, solving that equation? Well, before we solve it, let's make sure we sort of know what's going on. Or actually, we'll just go back and do our usual energy argument type of thing. And the problem is that um, if we use our energy argument, what we have is the, uh, well, we, we imagine that we have ourselves a wave here. And the comment is that uh, if we use a conservation of energy, which is true, of course, by the way, uh, for our equation that we've uh, written down here, but maybe we just need to be explicit about it. Oh, which we could get, like we did last time, by multiplying this equation by x dot, the velocity, and then this becomes the, second der the time derivative of the velocity squared, and the right-hand side becomes the derivative of a potential with respect to time. And so anyway, what that becomes is then that the energy is equal to the, the kinetic energy, mx, m, sorry, m over 2 uh, dx hat dt squared, that's the kinetic energy, uh, plus q phi, uh, tilde actually. And so this can be written as um, m over 2, let me say, call this vx squared, and then minus q uh, phi hat times the cosine of k x hat. Again, we're still in that moving frame. Well, in that moving frame, I can have particles then that are either, you know, if you just look at this relationship and solve for vx or something like that, or remember we had particles bouncing in a magnetic mirror, well, here we've got particles bouncing or trapped in a small potential. The amplitude of the potential here is, of course, phi. And, um, or actually I should say 2 phi, it turns out, because of the way I've defined it. Anyway, we can have trapped particles down here. Particles can be trapped in that particular well. Or we can have passing particles. And if we want um, particle trapping, so this yields particle trapping, if the kinetic energy becomes less than the potential, maximum potential energy, um, which is basically 2 q phi hat, has to be greater than m over 2 vx squared, uh, or alternatively, the opposite, we get passing particles. That is, they're not trapped by the, by the wave for the opposite limit, namely 2 q phi hat is less than m over 2 bx squared. So uh, the key aspect, I guess, I kind of want to remind you of uh, by this problem is that all we've done is given ourselves a sinusoidal potential and allowed particles to get trapped. And notice that the presence or absence of at least some particles being trapped is just that any time I have any finite amplitude wave, I will get this effect, infinitesimal as it may be. However, only very small energy particles relative to the, remember, uh, relative to the um, uh, wave phase velocity will, um, will be trapped. 
Remember here that my VX is, in fact, the original, so I should call that a VX hat, is the original VX minus the phase velocity omega over K. So it's really this VX, I should have put maybe a little hat on here to say this is the, the relative okay, velocity relative to the speed of the wave. So, so this is V phase equals omega F over K. Okay, now this is a problem we think we know how to solve. Okay? Uh, I mean, you know, we're used to calculating such particle orbits. So now let's go back and imagine we were making expansions just like we made last time where we said, well, let's, let's expand in the smallness of the electric field and let's iteratively try to solve this equation. And then let's imagine what else we might do. Um, so let's go back and look at our equation here. Um, this is what we got for our um, F equals MA equation. Um, so let's uh, solve by perturbation theory. And um, if we do so to lowest order, in the amplitude of the perturbation phi, to, phi hat, what would we do? Well, to lowest order, we'd just say, well, you know, let's just to lowest order neglect it. So we would have d squared x hat dt squared is equal to zero. What kind of orbit is that? Just straight line linear motion, right? X, uh, um, sorry, x hat or, you know, is equal to x hat naught wherever I started plus some velocity times time, okay? Just straightforward motion. So I'll call, I guess I'll call that Vx naught. What about first order in phi hat? Well, let me call that x naught, I guess. Then I would get d squared x1 hat by dt squared equals zero, or it equals now this um, driving force due to, the elect due to the perturbation I put on. And this is equivalent, by the way, to what we do when we call, do linear perturbation theory, right? Because we say, well, it's the lowest order things are straight line orbits, but then there's this little jiggle in the orbits caused by the presence of the wave. So anyway, d squared x1 dt squared is equal to minus uh, q phi hat over m uh, k sine of k x hat. But now... What we can do is we can say, well, look, this is kind of hard to solve, and this x, x is really x naught plus x1, right? This would be x naught hat plus x1 hat, my iteration sort of business here, plus dot, dot, dot. And let's just approximate that by neglecting everything in the rest of the series, okay? That's what we did before. We said, well, we'll just take the straight line orbit. And so what this turns out to be is then minus q phi hat uh, over m times k sine. Now we plug in the lowest order orbit, so we get k x naught hat uh, plus v x naught t. Um, does that exhibit trapped particles? And how would I? And what what would happen if I solved it? Well. Here, you know, all you end up with is that the particle motion will be now not just the straight line motion, but it'll now have a term which is plus the acceleration, the acceleration caused by the gradient of the electric field caused by this potential, and however that potential will just be oscillating in time. So I could solve such an equation. You know, you could get that x1 is equal to something proportional to, basically, um, Q phi hat uh, over M K sine K X naught hat plus V X naught T. Um, and then what if I went to second order? Well, what I would do is I'd come back here and I'd correct in my orbit equation, or I'm sorry, in my forcing term here, I would add this x1, which I just got. 
And roughly speaking, I'd find that x2, okay, the correction to second order would be proportional to phi hat squared. And, you know, and so forth, okay? How many terms do I need to have in this series in order to represent the particle bouncing back and forth and turning? Well, effectively, what I, it turns out what I, tried, what I would have to do to do that is to have all the terms in the series all the way to infinity because sine, you know, I'd have to have a kind of sine type function and I'd need all the terms from zero to infinity or one, you know, x, sine x would be x minus x cubed over three and so forth and so on. In principle, I would need all those terms to make it work. What happens if we only keep a finite number of terms? Well, we keep getting closer and closer to the possibility of a turning, but all we're doing is calculating the particles more or less going in a straight line, and it's just edging toward turning, basically, relative to the potential. But it jiggles along the way. Okay? So this obviously, now, you know, we know the answer of the particle is going to turn, so we, we don't use this procedure, right? What we do is we go back and we solve the original equation more directly because we know how to solve an equation like that. Uh, we don't make this perturbation expansion. But when you get into a nonlinear plasma theory and you start expanding, you don't know the real general problem that you're after or the solution of the general problem, but you end up making these small amplitude wave you know, uh, approximations. And so you, you have to watch out that you may, in fact, be expanding something which is non-expandable. So let's go back and say, how do we solve this equation uh, regularly or properly uh, to get what we need? Oh, I see that this should have been a 4, but uh, anyway. Um, so the question is, uh, how do we solve? Well, um, let's rewrite our equation, just putting it in a more customary form, um, namely putting the terms on the left-hand side. So we have d squared x dt squared plus, uh, and plus was critical here, q phi hat over m uh, k sine k x hat is equal to zero. How do we solve that equation? Well, one thing which is we often do um, is consider small oscillations. about the point x, x hat nearly equal to zero, which is to say nearly in phase with the wave. And at some stationary position relative to the wave. What we in particular mean is that k x hat is much less than one. Therefore, we approximate that the sine of k x hat is approximately equal to k x hat minus the cubed over three factorial so k x hat cubed. And of course, there's an infinite number of terms. Then our equation okay, becomes d squared x hat by dt squared is equal to q phi hat over mass. Uh, I'm sorry, I wanted this on the left hand side. Plus um, k squared x hat is equal to. So to lowest order, the sign is just kx. Then there's all these other ugly terms, but I'll stick those on the right-hand side. And so they give me q phi hat k over m, and then k cubed x hat cubed over 6. And, of course, I've got, in principle, an infinite number of terms. But if, okay, here's my wave going along. And if I'm interested in a trapped particle, which is just jiggling back and forth across the bottom of the well, and you know I don't get too much out of phase, why, all of that's about right. So roughly speaking, then, if I've satisfied that, then this is always small, and I need not worry about it too much. I can calculate a slight nonlinear distortion of what is otherwise just a harmonic oscillator, right? This is a harmonic oscillator. Um, 
what's the uh, bounce frequency? You know, what's the frequency with which I go through my sinusoidal motion here? Well, this is my omega squared. Oops, got to catch that. All right? So my omega squared will just be uh, k squared q phi hat over m. Or the frequency that I will oscillate at will just be k square root of q phi hat over m. Now you begin to see why it is that we couldn't make very good expansions. It's not only because we're dealing with sine kx and things like that, but notice that my frequency of oscillation is proportional to the square root of phi hat. And that's in a, in a, fun, a function which I cannot conveniently expand in, right? I mean, square root of phi hat is not something I can Taylor series expand around phi hat equals zero, which is where we would be doing it. So this is an example of a little bit of a way of doing the problem right. We can also go back and use the constant of energy, in energy constant of the motion and do an even better job, more general. In this particular calculation, notice that we had to be right near the bottom of the well. So we're, um, we're just talking about particles here, but we might like to know what the bounce motion or what the motion of the other particles are. So let's use the more general uh, procedure to solve this. And that procedure is uh, use um, energy constant of the motion. And just to remind you, that's the energy is equal to m over 2 uh, dx hat dt squared minus q phi hat cosine kx hat. Now I can solve that equation for dx dt. Okay? So that's just dx dt is equal to the energy minus the potential divided by 2 over m and the square root of that. So that's 2 over m energy minus potential. But minus becomes plus on the other side. So q phi hat cosine kx hat. Now the right hand side, because we transform to the frame of reference moving at the phase velocity, is only a function of x hat. It's not a function of time. So I can just convert this then into an equation dt is equal to dx hat divided by the square root of 2 over mass times energy minus or plus q phi hat. Phi hat's a constant here, remember, times cosine kx hat. And then in principle, okay, I can integrate this equation. And if I do that, I will obtain the temperature, or the time, is equal to some uh, function of x hat. What kind of function is that going to be, by the way? Anybody know what kind of integral I have dx over something plus cosine kx? Well, basically, it's elliptic integrals. But because it's not from 0 to pi over 2, it's so-called incomplete elliptic integrals. Okay. So when all is said and done, it turns out you can solve for x hat is equal to x hat of t. It's just a matter of looking, working all this out for trapped and untrapped particles and so forth uh, equals uh, uh, functions of incomplete elliptic integrals. or elliptic functions are sometimes called. Uh, in particular, they're the so-called so SN functions and CN functions, which are the sine and cosine type, the sine and cosine equivalents in elliptic functions to sines and cosines. But uh, <clears throat> the key point, really, beyond this, uh, well, so anyway, with these, we can get very good descriptions of the orbits for particles moving in the sinusoidal potential. And so all that pretty well uh, can be worked out. Now, 
but the, the key aspect, let me come back and say, is that by virtue of having had a finite amplitude wave, if we had zero amplitude wave, all particles are passing. Nothing can be trapped in a wave that doesn't exist. On the other hand, ever so infinitesimal amplitude wave traps a few particles. The process of particle trapping introduces a new physical phenomenon, particle trapping. And because it introduces, in a physical sense, a new physical process, particle trapping, it mathematically introduces an essential singularity type of phenomena or something that's not expandable, namely existence of trapped particles being different from untrapped particles or passing particles. So all of that tells you that even in small amplitude waves change what you're doing nonlinearly quite a lot sometimes. And the, the best way to say it is if by putting in a wave all it does is, is non-resonantly modulate things, then that doesn't cause any big trouble. But again, if it causes a new physical phenomena trapping to happen, then you often have to, to worry about it. So uh, to give you an example um, of the kinds of things you can get into then in a fully kinetic plasma, um, I want to go back to something which Chen actually talked about in chapter, uh, so let me say, example of trapped particle effects. And this was namely what are called BGK, or Bernstein, Green, and Kruskal modes. Um, and uh, this is, again, in Chen in Chapter 7, discusses this. And the basic idea is that in one dimension, you can arrange that the distribution function is, let us say, some arbitrary function of energy, of, sorry, of kinetic energy, mv squared over 2, maybe I should say mvx squared over 2, plus q phi of x. Um, and since this distribution function is then a function of a constant of the motion, energy, um, because of that, we know that df dt will be equal to partial of f with respect to e dE dt, but energy is the constant of the motion, so that's zero. So in fact, such a solution is not only a solution of the equilibrium, but it's forever a solution for any arbitrary phi of x. So what in fact you can do uh, is you can inject a potential into a plasma or arrange to have a potential in a plasma. So we'll have a green potential today, it turns out. And it can be quite irregular, okay? And then my job to, you know, in this distribution function, this is maybe as a function of x, <coughs> and this is uh, <coughs> f or phi, is that, uh, well, I should really say phi here, I guess. And then I've got, you know, I've got a certain group of trapped particles in here, and another group over here, and then between here and here I've got you know, another group of trapped particles in between here and here. I've got some other group of trapped particles. And providing I have enough stomach to, you know, uh, quantify all these processes, okay, um, I can, in principle, you know, have to calculate all these groups of trapped particles. And they're all okay. That is to say, I can have a self-consistent but very complicated distribution function, which is a function of energy, uh, for a rather arbitrary potential. And Bernstein, Green, and Kruskal showed that, in fact, uh, showed mathematically in great detail how you could actually construct such functions. As long as you don't have collisions. What if I have just a few collisions? Well, just a few collisions, okay, will take apart. This, this distribution function in velocity space would obviously be very singular, right? It, you know, I'm coming up here and jumps from one type of trapped particle to another. And so what collisions would tend to do um, is they would tend to mush out all the boundaries between traps and untrapped particles. And pretty soon 
uh, they would wipe out the possibility of this. Also, it turns out uh, this is only possible in one dimension. As you can imagine, arranging it in three dimensions uh, could be a little bit um, difficult. Okay, so what we found now is that we said, well, it, this perturbation procedure is really not too good because you know, it requires, in principle, an infinite number of terms, and we don't have uh, you know, either the algebraic capabilities or the, maybe the tenacity to calculate that. So then taking account of the potential in the lowest order orbits seems like a good thing to do. So one, of, one type of approach to nonlinear processes is then one having to do with so-called coherent nonlinear modes. So you propose sort of like a BGK type mode as the basic mode structure. So instead of proposing that the basic mode structure is e to the i k dot x minus i omega t, you propose that there's some coherent mode structure that's going to sit here and maybe move around in a plasma. And then that's the entity perhaps I ought to be looking at rather than sinusoidal waves, uh, plane waves. So let's talk about that a little bit. So the, the idea is, uh, this is sort of, I'll call it one approach to nonlinear processes. And this is basically what I'll call coherent nonlinear modes. And it's basically motivated by this observation that an infinitesimal potential, in fact, traps some particles. And when the wave um, does trap some particles, that causes a non-expandable effect, uh, which we would like to be able to take into account. OK, so uh, with this in mind, I want to talk about sort of uh, two examples of this. Um, and these are talked about in Chen. Uh, in some detail, and we'll just kind of hit the highlights here. Um, the first example is the basic one of the so-called V dot del V nonlinearity in the momentum balance, or the inertial term. Uh, you remember when we treated the momentum balance, uh, we always had MN on the left-hand side, dV dt, was equal to MN partial of V with respect to T plus um, V dot del V. And this was quite clearly nonlinear. But now what, what people do uh, is consider, add that nonlinearity to the otherwise linear treatment of, say, ion acoustic waves. So the idea is you add the V dot del V uh, inertia or nonlinearity term. Um, in the momentum balance. to ion acoustic waves. Now, since this comes about in a very primitive way in the ion momentum balance, you can kind of imagine fluids might give you effectively the same thing because fluids, the Navier-Stokes equations that govern fluids, uh, meaning neutral fluids like water and stuff like that, they have the same equation, so they'd have the same nonlinearity. And so indeed, what this leads to is the same thing as in water waves, namely a sort of ion wave steepening. And it also leads to something called solitons, which we'll mention briefly. Um, but if you work through the mathematics of the equation and de-dimensionalize a bunch of stuff just to produce it in a form that is kind of convenient, it becomes partial of u with respect to tau uh, in de-dimensionalized form. The equation becomes partial u with respect to tau du dc plus 1 half d cubed, d cubed u by d c cubed is equal to 0. And this is called the Kordofeg-de-Fries equation. 
or sometimes K dV equation. Um, what kind of an equation is this? Well, from this term and this term is what you get. It turns out the ion acoustic waves with, you, the, or the regular ion acoustic waves have been transformed out of this, and this turns out to be dispersion in the, in the modes. Uh, so it's already been moved to a moving frame of reference. And this term is a, looks like a V dot del V, right? It's U du dx sort of thing. So this is our nonlinearity. So it is a nonlinear equation, okay, because it has one nonlinear term. And it's sort of like taking account of the lowest order nonlinear term in the basic uh, uh, determination of the eigenmode, or the eigenmode of the, of the particular, uh, um, of the ion acoustic pulse, let's call it now. And what this does is it leads to soliton-like solutions. So let me sketch that here. This leads to what are called soliton solutions. And these have, let's call it a speed proportional to some C. They're funny waves. They're a nonlinear entity. An amplitude proportional to 3C. And a half height I'm sorry, half width proportional to the square root of 2 over C. And so if you look at these little pulses, if they're small, they're sort of slow moving and wide, small meaning low in amplitude. If, on the other hand, they're large amplitude, they're narrow and fast moving. Um, but they're, so this is like the, the phi hat or, or phi tilde, I mean, or the um, um, uh, U that we called here. And these have been transformed to the frame of reference, which is the ion acoustic wave frame of reference. So little pulses, nonlinear entities, which capture a few particles, okay, and there's part of the, non, part of the nonlinearity involves that, um, uh, can just move around in a plasma as nonlinear entities without damping uh, in a collisionless plasma. If I have a collision all plasma, uh, then, of course, they will get slightly damped. So you can find a, a fairly extensive discussion of this in Chen, his 8.8.1, uh, and also uh, in, there's a book, uh, R.C. Davidson, Ron Davidson, um, on methods in uh, nonlinear plasma theory. Um, by Academic Press, New York, 1972, Chapter 2. Has a whole chapter and much of the book devoted to some of these subjects. Okay, so that's one type of example of these um, nonlinear processes. Uh, namely adding the V dot del V nonlinearity and the momentum balance for ion acoustic or sound-like waves. The other type of example um, is the example of uh, adding a ponder Modi force to electron plasma oscillations. So this is add, remember we talked a little bit about the ponder Modi force last time, or force effects. Ponder-Modi force was sort of like the gradient of the uh, electromagnetic energy density, remember, with a dielectric constant, um, to electron plasma oscillations. And what this causes physically um, is it causes the plasma to leave the high-density regions. Um, and so it, in some sense, causes something which is called cavitons. Um, 
which is to say that the waves in the plasma cause the plasma to leave that particular region. You balance a combination of the um, plasma pressure and the electromagnetic energy, pre uh, energy density. Um, this leads to an equation of the following form, I d psi dt plus P uh, d squared psi by the x squared partial um, plus Q psi squared psi is equal to zero. And this is called the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. What kind of an equation is it? Well, the first is, here's our Schrodinger, our usual Schrodinger equation here. Okay. And what is this last term? Well, it's obviously a third order term. And so, you know, third power in the uh, potential or psi function here. Uh, and so this is a third order nonlinearity. And you remember the ponder motive force was basically a second order force, force that's second order in the electromagnetic energy density, and its effect on the wave will then be third order. So that gives you a third order nonlinearity. What kind of solutions does this give you? Well, it turns out if the plasma is stable, uh, for a stable plasma, this leads to what are called envelope solutions. And that's just basically the modulation of a wave. So, I'm sorry, on, on, envelope solitons is what I mean to say. Sorry. Solitons. So rather than have a soliton, which you remember was just a pulse without any wave structure, what this is is sort of like a, a pulse of, of a wave, okay, just a wave package, you could think of it. But it's a nonlinear entity, not a linear entity. Or if the plasma is unstable, it turns out then the group velocity is backwards in these situations, and this leads to something called a modulational instability. Breaks up the plasma. The, this entity breaks up into an instability, which is then called a modulational instability. I won't attempt to, to draw that. <laughs> um, anyway, so to see kind of more, more about this, uh, turns out C. Chen, 8.8.2. Uh, he discusses these uh, modulational instability type things. So with that, um, I'm sort of finished with talking about, let's call it the coherent types of effects. Um, so the idea is that you know, first we sort of said, well, we'll take particle orbits and we'll just kind of expand in the smallness of the perturbation. And we found, well, that wasn't so good if you had some trapped particles because that's a non-expandable effect. So here we've gone into saying, well, let's uh, take into account the lowest order nonlinearities in the equations and get ourselves some coherent nonlinear entities. This is appropriate if you have one finite amplitude wave. However, if you have many finite amplitude waves, all about the same size, then they're all sort of kicking the particles. And then you tend to go over towards a, a more you know, statistical description, a more turbulent description, or something like that. And so we'll take a break here, and that's what I want to talk about when we come back. <laughs>